strength and honor. Strength and honor. Theodore Roosevelt once said, the credit belongs to the man who is actually in the arena. I believe there's a hero in all of us that keeps us honest, gives us strength, makes us noble. So that his place shall never be with those cold and timid souls who know neither victory nor defeat. Seize the day. Whose face is marred by dust and sweat and blood. Who knows the great enthusiasms, the great devotions, and spends himself in a worthy cause. And I'm going to stay right here and fight for this lost cause. You've got to get mad. I mean plum mad dog mean. Our deepest fear is not that we are inadequate. Our deepest fear is that we are powerful beyond measure. Who at best, if he wins, knows the thrills of high achievement. And if he fails, at least fails while daring greatly. I'm going to show you how great I am. Hi once again, everybody, and welcome in. I'm Ed Berliner, and this is The Man in the Arena. Welcome to the brand new studio, Studio B, which is actually the music studio, which fits perfectly for those music-oriented interviews that we are going to do. Now, here's something I've always wondered. When you watch a conductor going to work with any sort of an orchestra, that conductor is serious, has the entire orchestra in his or her thrall at every single second. But here's something that I've always wanted to know. Don't the people in the seats already know the music? I mean, come on now. You have a conductor working it, but everybody knows where the music is going, so why do they need somebody there to actually tell them where they're going? Hmm, I wondered. I figured, why not go ahead and ask a conductor this? I just happen to know one. I happen to know one who started with the Jackie Gleason Orchestra on Miami Beach about 795 years ago. <laughs> or at least it feels that way when those of us start thinking about those days. And I actually remember watching Jackie Gleason on television when I was about this big, okay? And my dad had me watching it as well. But my guest is a great friend. I have known him for a long time. I actually first met him, I believe it was upstairs at a jazz club in Fort Lauderdale with a group called the Atlantean Driftwood Band, which we will discuss. He has been around the world many times. He is a Vietnam veteran as well, which I give him chops for. Somebody who was there and somebody who went through the experience. We'll talk about that a little bit as well. But most of his experiences come from the music. Guys like Jackie Gleason, guys like Sinatra, people like the Bee Gees. He has been intimately involved in the music for so many years. It is a pleasure to welcome into the man in the arena, my good friend, Peter Graves, joins us. Oh, and it's, by the way, not that Peter Graves, which I... This I've, is mission, mission Improbable. <laughs> mission Possible. Here he is. Uh, good to see you, my friend. Now, you know something? In all the pleasure years that you. you and I have known each other, I have never brought up the conductor side of things. Yeah. I have never, And I have never brought up the Peter Graves side of things because... <laughs> There are almost no pictures of you available anywhere. You are the secret individual that has managed to stay clandestine throughout the Internet for so many years. Go Peter Graves, and it's, there he is, the actor. Did anybody ever really get to you at that point and say, you don't look like the guy from Mission Impossible? Oh, yeah. <laughs> I've, I've, I've received uh, requests for autographs and everything else. You know, the, they send me his picture and ask me to sign it and get it back to him. You know? <laughs> no, let's 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 not go there. We'll, we'll leave that completely aside because it is not that Peter Graves. This is the man who knows his music. And how long have you been doing music for now? Do, do, do you want to say out loud? Ooh, long time. <laughs> long time. Okay. Professionally since 1967. Wow. Yeah. And that was part of the Gleason years, which yep. I, let's go ahead and start there because you and I sat down one day and this is how this whole thing got started. As we started getting around to getting the man in the arena ready, I said to Peter, we have to tell stories because that's what this whole series is about. Just stories with sure. interesting people, where they've been. And you, mm -hmm. the, the first person you brought up was Sinatra, which again, we'll get to in a moment. But then you went right to Jackie Gleason. You were part of that whole, that that historical time on Miami Beach when Jackie Gleason was out there mesmerizing the nation with all of these great acts from Miami Beach. How sweet it is! How'd you get involved in that? 
Well, it, it was very lucky, as a matter of fact. Uh, uh, I mean, to fast forward uh, a number of years, uh, the very first chance I had to do a um, recording with my own horn section um, was with Dr. John, and that album turned out to be the right place at the wrong time. And it's kind of been a mantra of mine. It's, it's how lucky you have to be. Uh, and going back to the Gleason days, uh, it was that. I was in the right place at the right time as opposed to the wrong place or anything like that. Uh, I had just come back from Vietnam, just gotten out of the na Navy. And ironically enough, the bass trombone chair, which was my instrument, opened up the, the pr previous season. Uh, the, the gentleman left and voila, it literally fell into my lap. Um, uh, I was fortunate that I had a number of contacts in town, so my name was, had already gotten out there, and they called. I said, you bet your sweet bippy, I'm down. <laughs> uh, and and it was a great show. I mean, it was a phenomenal experience. I did the last three years. It was on the air, 67, 68, 69. Uh, geez, we got to work with pieces of Americana, the, the Georgie Jessels, the Myron Cohens, uh, you know, and, uh, young, young uh, stars that went on to, to fame for years after that. I, I sat like you and I sat with Louis Armstrong and with him telling tales and stuff. Uh, none of my peers ever got the chance to, to work with Louis. So I feel very blessed and very honored. And I mean, besides that, it was great money. You worked 13 weeks out of the year. They showed the repeats during the summer, and you got paid to stay at home. What's wrong with that picture? Uh, nothing. Let's do it today. Right now, as a matter of fact. What was Gleason like? You hear so many different stories about the man and, and who he was and, and what he was right. like in dealing with people. Well, I mean, well, I was a young kid in the orchestra. I was 25 years younger than anybody else in the orchestra at that point. <laughs> and it's not like... Gleason and I had a lot of conversations, but I was a year or so out of the Navy at that point and kind of been growing my hair. Now I'm uh, the, the hippie look and he would come out on stage and I sat right next to the in the pit right next to the stage. <laughs> it seemed like every week he would come out and he'd take one look at me and just shake his head. <laughs> but, <laughs> but it was a marvelous experience. Um, the perfect example of uh, what you were inferring about conductors before one of the first thing the guys in the band told me about sammy spear he, he was not the world's greatest conductor you know was <laughs> you you watch him and you take the downbeat and then don't ever look again <laughs> so you okay. know there's a lot of that in the industry then, then let's get to that because that has always been and, and i swear to you i'm not making this up i have had people ask me before about conductors I said, right. wait a minute, the conductor is there, we understand that, but everybody has the music in front of them, everybody has practiced, everybody knows what's coming here. So yeah. give us an idea of, because I know you write as well, you're a brilliant writer, but with regard to conducting, what is it that you do and what is, what is the difference that a good conductor makes with an average orchestra and with a really good orchestra? Well, um, it actually differs from like a symphony orchestra to a jazz band. There are different things you need to do in different settings. Um, uh, again, I was very fortunate uh, early on, um, Henry Mancini, when I was contracting orchestras for him when he was down here in South Florida, he kind of took me under his wing and mentored me quite a bit. So I learned a lot from him about that. And a lot of it is being minimal and, and staying out of the way of the orchestra many times. But in a symphony orchestra, there's a lot of uh, tempo changes that obviously you have to be the one that sets that tempo. The volumes, uh, you're, you're, you're bringing the orchestra down, up. You're, you're conveying certain emotions to them that you're looking for them to achieve. Um, so you are there to make changes. It's not just it's not just basically walking them through the piece, but you no. are there, and as you feel the orchestra come to you and what's happening, you are yeah. in many ways adding an emotional level to, oh, to the orchestra. Absolutely. Yeah, and, and 
uh, I do some I've done over the years some career days where where you were asked to go into schools and convey to everything from a kindergartner into middle school kids what does the conductor do and I equate it to a traffic cop sometimes you tell them when to go when to stop how fast to go how slow to go how um, you know in the case of this it's the tempo comes out of the right hand, the left hand is doing volume uh, and, and entrances, that sort of thing. So it, in, in a symphony orchestra, it, it, it can be much, much more complex. In a jazz band setting, um, even though you said all of the, the key in, uh, ingredients are there on the paper, but in many cases, uh, in a jazz situation, uh, like when you turn somebody like Ed Kaye loose, uh, it's a matter of you you're, you decide when you're going to bring in the background. It's not a fixed time. So I'm listening to him and the emotional level that he and the rhythm section are bringing to the table. And I have to pick the proper moment to bring the rest of the band in with their, the background figures when we move on to the next section. None of that is scripted. We know where it's going to be, but when it happens is up to me to make that decision. Is it fair to say then that the really good musicians, you mentioned Ed Kaye, who's a great friend of ours, who's a, a Latin Grammy sure. winner who we've had on the show before, that these really exceptional musicians, and you mentioned Sammy Spear with the Gleason Orchestra, that maybe wasn't the best conductor in the world, that many times you have to sort of pick up the slack a little. You've got to feel that maybe if the conductor's not making it, that if you're in the, the band, in the orchestra, You've got to, sure. I don't want to say break a rule, but okay, you got to break a rule every now and then, maybe when the conductor gets it wrong, and you have to make sure that the piece doesn't get ruined simply because somebody makes a mistake. There have been many a band that has rescued a conductor. <laughs> <laughs> we'll, we'll leave it go with that. <laughs> have you ever seen that happen? I mean, you've, you've, you've actually oh, had that happen as part of, have you had that, you, you've watched that happen as part of an orchestra? I, I, I've seen it a couple of times. I've, I've, the, some of the tales I've heard are even worse than anything that I've experienced. <laughs> I've been very fortunate to have been uh, on the A-list, so to speak. I mean, I've really went from the Gleason show right into the frying pan. Um, but I mean, there are horror stories about uh, the great Henry Mancini's, you know, uh, days of wine and roses, you know, and stuff like that. Um, uh, and, and, uh, or, or if, what was it? There was a conductor that tried to conduct moon river in four, four, which is this wonderful waltz, you know, <laughs> <laughs> and, and the orchestra is just beside themselves, but they just can't look. They just cannot look. At that point, they just have to do what they know they have to do and hope that he stops waving his arms when they finish. <laughs> then let's talk about some more of those legends, because there's a couple that I do want to get to. You shared a story with me about Frank Sinatra that I thought was a brilliant story about you being involved in Sinatra, because for those who don't know and those of a certain age who may not be aware... South Florida was sort of Sinatra's home. He, his second home, if you will. He was here. He loved it. He filmed a couple of really great detective movies down here from the Tony Rome series, which I think were sort of like the Ocean's Eleven series. Just come down. Don't even give him a script. Just let him go out and act. And that was basically what Frank did. But he came down to South Florida. You got involved. You stayed involved. Tell us that story. Yeah. Well, I mean, he... Uh uh had played the the fountain blue for years um and in a lot of those orchestras uh, when i first one of the very first ones i played in uh, i remember Whit Seidner who headed up the jazz department at the university of miami when he came down from uh indiana university around the same time i i got out of the navy uh we were playing in one of the the local hotel orchestras and for the most part a lot of the players had just come to florida to retire and weren't maintaining their chops, and it wasn't the most important thing to them at that point in their careers. And and it just, some of the bands were average at best, we'll call it. Uh, there were some great players. Go ahead, go ahead, but, say it out loud, they weren't very good. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but overall, some of them were very good, but they just chose not, they didn't keep their, their, their game together. Okay. Um, um, but there were some delightful ones as well. But the the Whit and I had a conversation one night. We were playing. I remember. I think it was 
uh, uh, Diana Ross and the Supremes. And in between shows, we were having a cup of coffee and, and it was just saying, you know, there was two young whippersnappers in town. He was at, on the university side and the educational side, and I was running bands out on the commercial, on the, the uh, for-profit side. And that, that we were either going to have to try and change that environment or get out of Dodge, one or the other. Um, fortunately, you know, there was some the time that uh, Sinatra was at the Fountain Blue. They, they had had some funky experiences there, and then fortunately, Witt Seidner got involved and started bringing in some younger players, and that certainly helped there. Uh, but fast forwarding to after my five years at Bachelors Three and doing a lot of uh, artists there. When oh, don't worry. Recently, I'm going to get to Bachelors 3 in a moment. Trust me, I, I am, I am not going to let that era yeah. go by. <laughs> stay with the Sinatra. There was a big gap in there where he didn't come to Florida much at all. Um, from the, the heyday of the late 60s, all through those early 70s, you know, he, he wasn't here all that much. By 1977, uh, which was our first full season at uh, the Sunrise Musical Theater, I had taken the band from Bachelors, and now we added the full string section. It was now a very large orchestra, and that initial year had uh, Bob Hope, uh, Henry Mancini, Debbie Reynolds, Frank Sinatra. I mean, it was just a, a who's who list, and obviously nervous about Sinatra. Uh, and the promoter and the um, owner there at the theater, uh, Ben Siegel, who had run the Wallingford Theater in Connecticut, um, about two weeks before Sinatra was due to come in, usually the general rule is we get together on opening day, we do a four-hour rehearsal, and then we play the first show that night. And that's pretty much standard routine. Well, it turns out uh, he told me we have to do two days of rehearsal with Sinatra. And so I'm a little bit more nervous now than I was, you know, figuring what's going on. So we get together for the first day of rehearsal. We do the first set, the first hour of the rehearsal tells everybody to take a break. The only person sitting in that 4,000 seat theater is Ben Siegel, the producer, sitting out there by himself. And as we're taking the break, Frank waves him up and they have a little private conversation down by the front of the stage. And I'm thinking to myself, what's going on? You know, I have no idea what's going on. So we come back uh, after our break. We play a little bit more, maybe another 20, 30 minutes. Frank tells everybody, that's enough for today. I'll see you tomorrow. So we everybody starts to pack up and leave. Ben signals to come up, see him in his office. Well, it turns out <laughs> that... Um, he Frank had said he wanted to bring his New York band down, that he really didn't want to trust doing the show with the Florida musicians. Um, and then Ben had struck a deal with him that I was unaware of, that he said, you come down with an extra day of rehearsal. If you don't like this band, I'll fly your New York band in on my nickel and they will be here for opening night. Well, as I said, I was nervous enough finding that out. Yeah, the pressure that, wasn't on before. The pressure else. is really on now at this point, man. Oh, man. Yeah, it was something else. But we came back the next day. He loved it on opening night in front of a, a, a full house. When it comes time to introduce the band, he usually, you know, they, they introduce their traveling musicians, his conductor, Bill Miller, his drummer, Irv Kotler, and the, the, the various four, five, six players that were traveling with him. And generally then whatever city they're in, they say, and the blah, blah, blah orchestra, in this case, the Peter Graves orchestra, the whole orchestra stands up, they take a quick bow, they sit down and we go on. This night, he turned around and pointed at me and said, you stand up. <laughs> well, he proceeded, I felt my life, you know, flashing in front of my eyes. Uh, he did a, a, a tribute. He said, uh, what a, uh, something to the effect of what a, a wonderful, magnificent resource you have here in South Florida. Don't let this guy and this orchestra get away. Keep them here forever. It was like putting money in the bank. It was just, you know, it was like, 
beside myself. That's it. At that point, you just want to go ahead and say, I'm done. I'm out. My life's good at this point. I can move forward. Yeah. (laughs) It it was, you know, I mean, totally unexpected. You know, um, I'm like shaking like a leaf, you know, because I'm like a young guy. I'm only like, I don't know, 20, 30, 30 years old or something. You know, it was pretty intense. But it obviously cemented my reputation in, in South Florida, and it certainly opened up all that many more doors. You mentioned Bachelors 3, and let's take care of that very quickly because i got a couple sure. of other things I want to get to. Again, for the uninitiated, Bachelors 3 was the nightclub, if you will, it might be a good way to put it, owned by Joe Namath uh, and a bunch of other folks. But Namath is the guy who owned it when the Jets played the Super Bowl in Miami. It was Joe's club. Yeah. It was in Fort Lauderdale, which is the intersection of Sunrise Boulevard and Federal Highway. And every time I pass it to this day, I go, I think now it's a bank, which is oddly enough, I think, sort of apropos in in many ways for what it was. But that was the place for years. That was the place where every celebrity went of any kind went. And you were in that for for several years. That had to be amazing to watch that generate that that sizzle on, on a nightly basis. Yeah, I mean, it was a, a an evolution right off of the Gleason show. Like I said, I did that 67, 68, 69. Um, I spent the next couple of years in between there and when we went to Bachelors in 72, I think it was, uh, uh, I had formed, I had gotten the, the bug about rock and roll. Up until then, I was more classical and jazz. Uh, uh, I had done some arranging of Beatles tunes in the Navy, you know, with, that we would play for the, for the guys when we were doing various events. But it wasn't until during the Gleason show that the Beatles recorded a, a Day in the Life, and George Martin helped craft that whole thing. And it, you know, it finally dawned on me that that marriage between the music that I always greatly appreciated, the classical and, and, and the, the jazz musicians and the well-educated music and the, the, the energy of the rock and roll world could coexist. Up until then, I was not sure. Um, and so that e- evolved my thinking. So in those years, while I was doing the Gleason show, I was forming bands, um, the horn bands, uh, all of the Blood, Sweat and Tears, Chicago, so we were um, working at the Newport as a uh, the house band, uh, backing up the treasure chest dancers and doing cover <laughs> sto- songs. There's and another story. story in there. If you start talking uh, about that area and the treasure chest oh, dancers, you can do that and for an hour. At the castaways with Georgie, <laughs> yep. Georgie, and the crybabies. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that, that whole other a lot of stories we still can't tell. <laughs> But it was there that I was at while we were the house band. I was asked first for the first time to put together a band to back a, a, a headliner. They were going to bring in Frankie Avalon uh, into the Newport there uh, down uh, downstairs. And I said, by all means, I could uh, put together the orchestra. Well, we get together. It's a, a 13 piece band. The band was a kick, killer band. Uh, and the review the next day in the uh, Miami Herald, I think it was, uh, the headline was, what a difference a band makes. Didn't mm. even mention Avalon. Uh, wow. <laughs> yeah. But that helped, you know, seven. So those years from there, we did a number of shows there. I moved up to the Marco Polo. Uh, we backed uh, Frank Gorshin, uh, Wilson Pickett, uh, a, a, a number of acts that they brought in there. And it was during that time that uh, I was asked to go interview with Bobby Van, who was one of the three bachelors. It was, yep. you're right, it was Joe Namath was the the name factor. Brea Bruzzi was one of his best friend. Um, uh, I think they went to uh, college together at Alabama and then Ray went to the Buffalo Bills, I believe. Um, and so there were two football players and Bobby Van was the nightclub operator in New York City that they had met. I think he was running Guys and Dolls, I think at the time. Uh, and when they decided to form and create the Bachelors Threes, uh, there was one in Birmingham, Alabama, and Joe's, you know, the college hometown. Um, and then the Fort Lauderdale one became the most famous or infamous, as you might say. Uh, and when we were asked to come up there, the very first two shows we did were Nancy Wilson and Mel Torme. Then we went on to doing The Supremes, The Temptations, The Four Tops, Little Anthony, the Blood, Blood, Sweat, and Tears, David oh. Clayton after he left there. Uh, and people I mean, got to the, realize the this wasn't... just went on and on and on. This wasn't a big 
a big arena. I mean, the names yeah. you're mentioning are the kinds of acts that even if you're in your 20s or your 30s, if you do a little research, you'll find that these were the acts. You would expect them to appear in right. massive, large arenas. This was a, a, a bandbox in many ways. I don't know how many people it held, but it was a club. It was a little nightclub that basically had, I don't know, a few hundred people and people of yep. this acclaim appearing in, in, a, in, a, in a club like that would be unheard of today. Well, it was actually right on the cusp before it became an arena world. Um, uh, it, it was actually, we were there right up and through the, the spring of 76. Uh, and during the, all those years, we were working those artists and they were, there was a, a circuit of, there was a club up in um, Pennsylvania that was on the same circuit and the, the holiday house, I think was the name of it. And they would work these various clubs around the country that had in anywhere from 300 to, I think, um, with the last build out bachelors, he squeezed anywhere someplace in the five to 600 range Yeesh. into that club by kept moving walls back. Yeah, and, and then when you talk squeeze, you're, you're, you're definitely talking squeeze. You're, you're, you're really talking standing room only squeeze shoehorn. type. Yeah. Yeah. We're talking squeeze them in with a shoehorn here. You know, <laughs> uh, it was pretty intense. I mean, to the point where the band got backed up, they built a box on the back of the, 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 the wall. So we could put the trumpets and the drums closer to Sunrise Boulevard. They, it got to the end where the back, the trumpet player's backs were about four feet off of Sunrise. Uh, but, I mean, that's how they they did it. But that was the end of that Supper Club era, um, starting when he closed in the spring of 76. Sunrise Musical Theater was being built and opened. Uh, we opened December 29th with uh, uh, Bobby Vinton. That was the very first day uh, of the Sunrise Musical Theater. And that started that whole arena thing. Uh, the perfect example is Sinatra. Up until then, he would work the the La Ronde room at, at, at the Fountain Blue. He would do the, the Vegas things. Starting with when Sunrise came on board, uh, he worked there a couple of years. That was, that was a 4,000-seat arena. Uh, we worked him there a number of times, and then we moved to the Miami Arena. I think we did one down there. Uh, it just became, everybody wanted to be in the big arenas. It was all about the dollars. It's just that, that was just the economics of yep. the thing. I think I might've so, been at that. Some uh, clubs are gone at that point. I think I might've taken my parents to that Miami arena show. As a matter of fact, now that I think yeah. back, I, I believe yeah. I might've been there. A couple of minutes I got left. I want to make sure we squeeze this in. You also worked with the Bee Gees. Our good buddy yep. Eddie Kaye worked with the BG, uh, the Bee Gees. Still knows them very well. Very tight family. Wonderful people in South Florida. What was it like working with legends? I mean, you, you've already mentioned. Look, you've already mentioned Gleason and Sinatra. Yeah. But the Bee Gees, as well as anybody, changed South Florida, changed music sure. in America, changed music around the world in just a short span of time. Those that's working with true iconic figures of music yeah well they that, that they are i mean when they first called again like i said earlier in my career i didn't pay as much attention to early rock and roll so <laughs> i was really kind of unaware of some of their early uh, incarnations um uh and i got we were fortunate enough to, uh, while we were at Bachelors, so that the, everything was exploding for us. We were um, being asked to come down to Criteria and do horn sessions. Uh, we had done the Dr. John Wright Place Wrong Time, rocketed to number one in the nation. Great album. Fed on to uh, Bill Wyman with the Rolling Stones, asking us to do an album with him. That's his horn section. The next thing I know, I get a call from the Bee Gees. Um, they're over on the Isle of Man living over there. Uh, and they asked me to fly over to interview with them. Um, so I f uh, flew over there. We hit it off. Uh, and and it, that started uh, 1975, I guess it was. And, and it led right into, at that point, they weren't citizens. So they had to come here and, and uh, they're only half the year until they became uh, uh, citizens and could stay the full year. So we started doing Children of the World and just... You know, I, I had done my homework at that point, obviously, to realize just 
what a huge library of, of amazing songs they had already done up until that point. Uh, I was certainly aware of the main course before we started with them where they did jive talking stuff, but we came in with Children of the World, uh, which ironically became the, the thematic thing the, behind a huge concert we did at the United Nations where all the money proceeds went to the Children of the World uh, that David Frost um, uh, hosted. We had we shared the stage with uh, Rod Stewart, uh, Earth, Wind, and Fire, Donna Summer. I mean, it was amazing. All right on the same stage of the, the General Assembly of the United Nations. And every one of those groups uh, were asked by the Bee Gees. We played uh, Too Much Heaven. Uh, all the royalties from that song went to the UNICEF, the Children of the World. And each of these other artists at their behest donated the proceeds from one of their songs to the children. It was an amazing thing to, to, to partake in, but it just gives you a sense of the power that these guys are held in across the entertainment landscape, that, that they could pull something like that off. And to be a part of that family through that whole era, um, they, they were wonderful. We did two major tours in 76 uh, here at last. We did the Spirits Having Flown, but we had a private Boeing jet, you know, that were going around. Uh, it was just an amazing experience. Their mom and dad traveled with us. We watched the kids grow up. There was a point where my wife was pregnant on the 79 tour with our first daughter, and Linda was pregnant with um, Allie, I think it was, and I think Yvonne was pregnant. And they, we'd be out on the stage playing You Should Be Dancing or something, and the three pregnant wives would be over on the side doing the like a Rockettes kick. Um, <laughs> some amazing, you know, it, it was just wonderful time. And then uh, on top of it, they were such prolific songwriters that we did spinoff records. We did uh, Dionne Warwick's Heartbreaker together. But we did Kenny Rogers and Dolly Parton, Islands in the Stream. Uh, we did two albums with Barbara Streisand. We did the Guilty album. And then 25 years later, we did uh, Guilty Pleasures. Uh, so it's been an amazing ride. Um I mean, he's gone on to an, a, a, other music directors since then. You know, he always keeps a, a very young, hip band, and, and uh, I'm thrilled, and I still remain close with him. I'm still actually involved with the project with them at the moment. Um, but, you know, that was a huge part of my life. I mean, it shaped so much of who I am and, and what I did. You pa package that with the Sinatra years, um, all the things, and during the whole midst of this, the bass player that was with me at Jock in at Bachelors, Jocko Pastorius, went on to have, wow. have a historic career. I became then after he left, he had a solo career. I became his conductor, and we traveled all over the world releasing records. And yeah. now I'm the I hold I uh, run the Jocko Pastorius big band which now we go up and we've done the Blue Note in Tokyo and we've done the North Sea Jazz Festivals uh, in, in the Netherlands. So I just realized that we didn't even get a chance to talk about Jocko. Months. I mean, there's 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 a whole hour that we could do just on jazz and, and Jocko Pastorius in himself. Yeah. You uh, have to understand, all of those things were going down at the same time. Yeah. Jocko stuff, the Sinatra tours, the Bee Gees, the recordings, all these things. It was like, it was hard to get your hands around sometimes. I mean, only lately I've started trying to chronicleize and, and you know, we're so busy doing it. Nobody ever thought about writing any of that. I'm stuff writing down. the book. I'm writing the book. That That's that's it, man. You and I were writing the book. I go ahead. We're, we're starting it right here. This is going to be the forward. <laughs> Look, I only got about a minute left here real quick. The one artist that you've worked with that to this day, you simply shake your head and go, I worked with that person my God, I never could have imagined that. It's hard to get Sinatra I know. on that list. You know, yeah. I mean, really here. But I got to tell you, I mean, especially now, um, Darius Rucker is a, a, a dear friend. I love this man. Uh, we, Our mutual friend was is Dan Marino. And it was back in the late 90s. Uh, Darius and he were friends and Darius was over at the, his house in Weston and had mentioned how much he always liked doing the Sinatra songbook. He loved those songs. So Dan calls me and he said, get over here now. And that started the uh, thing. And we still are still doing 
these events to this day. He puts a tuxedo on. We do the uh, many of the songs out of the Sinatra songbook, and we raise all kinds of money for children's charities around the, the, the country. Uh, we just did one in Vail uh, a couple of months back. Uh, it's just he is a delight, and, and he keeps me young. I want to tell you, and we've talked about Darius off the air and, and privately before, if they ever need a guy to stand on stage and help or chronicle something or be there, I am there because I would love to be able to help you at, at anything I could do and, and any time that you work with these people because, my friend, you are living a life that I have always wanted to live. It is so much fun to be around the music, and that is why we're doing this series. we got to spend some time again and talk about Jocko. we got to spend some time sure. to talk about Darius. We and there's so many much. other people behind the oh. scenes that, that you need to talk to as well. There are, yeah, and it's nice to see. We can tell people here that uh, Ed Kaye is putting us in touch with so many people. We are going to tell so many musical stories here on The Man in the Arena. It is the kind of stuff that I have always been looking to do. Mr. Graves, it is always a pleasure, my friend. I know that you're always busy. It's great to get a chance to see you from time to time. I can see you from time to time right here, but we got to share a beer. Wherever we are, we share a, <laughs> we share a cocktail, Fair and that's a whole lot better. It's always a pleasure, my friend. My best to the wife as well. Stay well. I'll look forward to talking to you again real soon. Thanks so much, Peter. Indeed. Thank you. Peter Graves, one of the absolute wonderful people that I have come to know over the years, and his music, the way he crafts the music. If you're in South Florida, if you're anywhere for that matter, and you get a chance to see Peter Graves conduct an orchestra or work with somebody, do it. It'll be one of the best evenings or afternoons of your life. Reminder once again, some of the best times of your life, right here on The Man in the Arena. Way to get a hold of us. It's all right here. Email. Uh, for those of you who are listening on the podcast, the audio podcast, here we go. We've been flashing it all show long. The email is arena at edberliner.com. Social media, at Berliner Speaks. It's on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. The podcast platforms where you can hear all of these interviews in their entirety in audio only. iTunes, Google Play Music, TuneIn, Radio Public, Spreaker, CastBox for Android, and also Spotify. If you have any trouble getting anything on any of these platforms, go to edberliner.com. It's where all the video and the audio is at all the times. My thanks to Peter Graves. My thanks to you. And until we meet again right here on The Man in the Arena, rock on, true believers. You still here? It's over. Go home. Go. Go.